So uh, I know you've seen this picture already, but I'd like to start by saying that uh, this time for me is uh, is quite. Uh, oops. So this time to, to me is quite emotional because uh, uh, my mind, when I prepared this talk, went back to my very early days in research. And this picture was taken back in 89 you know, by Villa. You can walk to the villa from here. And this was really my first uh, scientific outing. And I started to organize this beautiful uh, conference on the Riccati equation in control signals and systems. And this was my very first encounter with a lot of important people there and a landmark in my own life. Because this was the time when I really decided that academia has to be home to me. And I decided to undertake a career in this field. And uh, uh, it's very emotional to be back to the same place some 28 years after on this very, very special occasion to me, which is a Sergio's retirement. Uh, and uh, well, we all know that Sergio will be with us as a lead and uh, a mentor for many years more to come. But still, you know, it's an important time for people like me and the others in this room that have grown uh, next to Sergio for so many years. So this is really part of uh, Sergio's uh, public site. And uh, uh, we know that Sergio uh, is a, a great contributor to the field of uh, control systems theory with the special emphasis on system identification, periodic systems. Uh, and uh, uh, I have here a list, of, I mean, just the list of Sergio's publication, not the publications themselves. So he's a great contributor. And besides, he has been a, a great organizer of many events. So I, I, I just put down a, a short list of some of the events, a short selection that uh, uh, he has organized. The second one up there is the meeting that I mentioned before. And the Alpha World Congress uh, is uh, in a the last position, not in time, because he organized other events after that. And the picture down there has been taken uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, IFAC in Milano, and uh, he has been uh, editor-in-chief uh, of the uh, European Journal of Control, funding member of AOK, and so on and so forth. So everyone in this room, I for sure, knows all this. So this is a Sergio's public site. But there is also another site that is uh, way more important to people that have grown next to him, which is a uh, search of personal life. And uh, <laughs> so, I, 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 like, I, I would like to say, I like to say that uh, uh, search of personal side to those that have grown next to him, is way more important uh, than the public side. And uh, Sergio has never drew a sharp distinction between his work life uh, and his personal life. And uh, together with Sergio in the early days, when I was young researchers back to those years, 89, 90, 91. So in those years, we used to spend a lot of time together. And it was not at work uh, or the university. We were spending time, for example, at the Sergio's place. And uh, Paolo will remember those old days. It was mainly the three of us meeting at Sergio's place, spent a lot of time together. And uh, Sergio has been a generous mentor, giving himself his time, uh, his devotion to young people, particularly teaching and giving a lead in research topics that had to be pursued, but also, uh, and I'm following here what Mark just said, teach you how a paper must be written. And uh, this is so important when you're young, because I mean, uh, you are not uh, just a student at the university, you become friend to your mentor. And uh, this is uh, a great value to people that uh, 
have had the fortune to have uh, Sergio as, a, as the mentor. Uh, actually, uh, together with Sergio, we also spent a lot of time, uh, not during uh, work days, over the weekends, you remember that, Sergio, and uh, it was quite common for us to to the university over the weekends, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, because for Sergio, Saturday was a good time to do research with the students. Uh, and in, this, in these old days, the department could not be accessed so easily. So there, is, there was no badge. And the deal was that you had to put in the system a, a request to get in advance. Uh, and then, Sergio, you remember that we were stopping at the custodian's place that was sitting uh, in the building next to the electrical engineering building. And we were stopping there, and the custodian was disabling the alarm system to let us in. One day, Sergio had forgotten to to, to put the uh, request in advance, so we stopped there, and of course the Castagna could not let us in, because, I mean, this was against the rule. So we ended up walking in the neighborhood, uh, looking for a place where, could, where we could do some good research and write the paper together. And uh, we ended up uh, in front of this church. <coughs> and the priest came out, uh, and uh, Sergio, with his uh, you know, unique style, started talking to the priest, you know, I'm a professor at the university and he's a young researcher, and uh, would you like to give us a hand? So we ended up writing this paper in a room in the oratory given by the priest. So, I mean, uh, this, this is one fact that happened among many, and uh, it is so important to young people, and I believe that many are sharing in this room my feelings, uh, it's important that you're not just uh, led by an instructor, a mentor, that you're friend to him or to her. And uh, this is what Sergio has been for me. And uh, he has been so generous uh, in spending his time, his life, without never ever drawing a line between work, uh, personal life. Uh, so for him, the two were just one single thing. And uh, I believe it's not coincidence uh, if uh, Sergio's tree is this big. I mean, this is Sergio's academic tree. And uh, you know, I jotted this down before coming here. So please, if there is someone in this room that is not mentioned there, don't cast an evil eye on me. So uh, this is just you know, uh, some of those that uh, have been uh, uh, generated from Sergio. And if you go to the Politecnico of Milano, half of the group in control comes after him. And I'm not in Milano myself, so I went to Brescia, and the Giuseppe Di Nicolao, who I believe is in this room, he went to Pavia, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, this is not by coincidence. This is due to the unique attention, devotion, and generosity of a person who has spent his life towards uh, promoting the talents and abilities of young people, giving them the impression that they count. Giving them the impression that they count. Having said that, so let me uh, move to something which is more technical here. And I would like to go back to this picture. And people here in front are smiling because I, I picked this from my early days in research. So here we go back to 89, 1990, again to those times when we were meeting at Sergio's place. And the Sergio recognized here the excitation and excitation subspace. So this was minimum variance adaptive control, my first encounter with real research. And uh, there is uh, up there a system, it's it or not as the, the parameters, they are unknown, y is equal to phi, did not plus noise. And uh, we came up with this idea. So this is the parameter space, which can be split in two, that we call excitation and unexcitation subspace. Excitation subspace is the subspace where the total amount of information grows unbounded with time. So basically, if you take phi and you project onto the excitation subspace your sum of a time, this keeps increasing and eventually goes to infinity. Whereas the, ex, the unexcitation subspace is where the total amount of information you collect through time keeps bounded. And for that very reason, you cannot expect to get 
a consistent estimate of the system parameters in their denacitation subspace. So, uh, oh, speaking of this, there is something else that, that, that comes back to my mind. Uh, so, uh, Sergio, that's a public confession I'm making uh, with the 28 years of delay. And this has to do with you, Paolo. Probably you remember that. One day, when we were working on this, Paolo came to me and he said, oh, listen, Marco, uh, all this business of the excitation and excitation is, is great. But, you know, it's also kind of obvious. So I believe that perhaps the day after we publish the paper, someone can knock at our door and say, and say to us, listen, but I did this 20 years ago. So my public confession to you, Sergio, is that I've never let you know of this conversation I had had with Paolo uh, in the fear that it was, I mean, I was working towards my very first journal paper here. So I feared the fact that you said you were stopping. I said, OK, then we have to investigate the literature more deeply. And you know, in those old days, going to the literature was not that easy as it is now. So I confess that uh, I did not tell you. And in fact, the paper was published. Uh, oh, by the way, no one ever knocked at our door. Uh, so uh, that's the, uh, the idea. And then you go to new environment stability control. And this is another landmark, which is this uh, real system versus imaginary system story, where on the right, you have the system that is in the mind of the designer. So you estimate theta hat. So theta hat is in the mind of the designer. And the controller C is optimally designed for theta hat. And on the left, you have the real, the real system, which is the system carrying the true parameter value, theta naught. Now, you take a look at the two and you say, OK, they are different. Because theta hat does not converge towards theta naught because of the unexcitation part. But since this part is not excited, externally, they behave the same. Because the mismatch is in the unexcitation part, which is not excited by the signal that are circulating in the system. So based on that, we came up with these uh, equations. Uh, the uh, cost for the real system is the same as the cost for the imaginary system, because they behave the same. But the controller has been designed to be optimal for uh, the imaginary system. So this boils down to J imaginary optimal. And, and there is an end here, because that's important. When it comes to minimum variance, uh, the optimal cost uh, is constant uh, throughout all plants, because this boils down to the variance of the noise. So if you achieve optimality for the imaginary, you also achieve optimality for the real, and you're done. You get optimality. Uh, so this uh, is the kind of things that were going on in 88, 89, 1991. And uh, it was uh, eventually published in this paper in uh, automatic control. In the end, it was not my very first paper. Actually, the second, the second paper I published. Then we continued. Other control costs. So you remember, Sergio. Other control cost, there is a main difference. Because if you uh, take another control cost, it is no longer true that the optimal value is constant uh, throughout the, uh, all the plants. So for other control costs, take LQG, for example, you can again go back to the same picture and say, OK, the real system behaves the same as the uh, imaginary system, same as before. But this time, there is a, ma a major difference, uh, which is uh, the one up here. So you can say, OK, since the two behave the same, real, uh, J real is J imaginary optimal. Because the control up there is designed to be optimal for the imaginary system. But then you say, OK, J imaginary optimal normally is bigger than or equal to J real optimal. It cannot be less. Because otherwise, J real is equal to J imaginary optimal. And J imaginary optimal is less than J real optimal. So you go super optimal, which is impossible. Then you start to understand, OK, and this is a system identification independent. So you start realizing that uh, in closed loop identification techniques have a tendency to return estimates such that correspond the optimal cost uh, 
will be larger than the optimal cost for the true system. And provably, there are cases where you can get stuck where it is larger. And that this leads to suboptimality. So together with Sergio, we were studying uh, uh, the fact that you need some active learning, which is totally missing here. And uh, I see you know, eminent people uh, in adaptive control sitting in this room. So we call it dual, dual effects. Uh, and uh, this is what, what we were studying. So uh, take the optimal value as a function of theta. So there is no system identification here. That's the optimal value, for example, for LQG, depending on theta. So if it comes to LQG, you solve the Riccati equation, and you get that. Now, you take a look at the picture, and you go first for the minimizer. So this one. That's the minimizer. That's the theta, theta bar, which gives you the smallest possible cost. And you design a controller which is optimal for that case. And now uh, you start arguing that one of two things may happen. Either you, uh, you put that controller in the loop, either you incur that cost, and then you may have not consistently estimated the true value. But who cares? Because you go home happy. You got the best possible result. Or vice versa, you may incorrect cost, which is not as good as that one. But then you come to know that theta naught is not the true value. Because if it were, you have control theta naught with the optimal controller, and therefore you should incur the optimal cost. In the second, you just drop that, and you go to the second best. And you keep going. You keep going. And the truth is a procedure, you can eventually prove the optimality J real is equal to J real optima, and we call this Bob, which is bet on the best. Uh, actually, uh, the story is way more complicated than this, because, uh, of course, you cannot jump from one to the other, because theta is a continuum, so you have to move uh, with care around. Uh, and, also, uh, and also, in finite time, you can never be sure what you dismiss deserves to be dismissed because uh, there is noise. So in finite time, the core cost is not the asymptotic, and so on and so forth. But you can imagine that a lot of the subtleties, but in the end, the story goes through, and, uh, and, you, get, uh, and you get optimality. So this is, and, and this is the paper where this was published. So uh, let me say that. Uh, this was uh, what was after and what I've been after for quite many years. Uh, and uh, then I moved to also other topics. And when I was preparing this talk, okay, so uh, that's the time when you look behind you and in retrospect, you analyze your research life. And uh, certainly, I can say, I can tell that uh, I been doing a lot of winding, exploration, at time random, always driven by, mainly by interest. I'm a fortunate person, so moving from one topic to another. However, there is one main trend that has always been with me in my scientific exploration, and I believe this is led by the interest for data-driven and observation-driven methods. So what I call inductive methods. And this interest was brought to me in my very early days when I was doing that type of research. I would like to move to the extreme and to claim that I believe that the most important problem in science is how knowledge can be created out of experience. I believe this is the most important problem in science, how knowledge is created out of experience. And uh, if I look in retrospect, I can say that most of my own research has been driven by an interest for that that was so definitely in my mind, my early days of research, uh, when I was doing adaptive control. And uh, if time permits, I would like to spend uh, 
one time moving to this, which is decision making, and also to highlight the differences with what I did in my early days. So very quickly, uh, take a function j, x are optimization variables, a list of them, a vector, and that is uncertainty. So knowledge about uncertainty can be acquired through experience. That's very general. That's not adaptive control. So just to give you an example, you can think of portfolio optimization, for example. And in this case, very quickly, uh, let's say that you have $1, the assets, uh, PK is the percentage of capital you put on different assets, and X, therefore, are the percentages, uh, and you end up writing this function where this is the sum of assets uh, of how much you put on each asset times the rate of return, which is uncertain, because you put the money in the stock market today, you collect tomorrow, that's uncertain. So what is experience in this case? This previous uh, behaviors uh, of different assets. You take this, and the RKI is the rate in return of asset K over period I, and this is called scenarios, which you can plug into your J function, and you end up having this. Since this refers to the past, that's, that's known. So what you're left with, what you're left with uh, is the value of uh, each and every portfolio X. So based on that, you can uh, make up your best uh, setup. So say that you have uh, various observations, you plug them into there, and you get functions of x, this, this, this. And then this is your knowledge. Knowledge that comes from experience that you would like to project uh, onto the next stage, which is the next investment. And you can do whatever you want. Just uh, pick one, uh, which is worst case optimization over past cases, for example, where you select X star to be the decision that incurs the uh, least costs uh, for the worst case. And you call this a scenario program. So, and then you start asking embarrassing questions. Like, what are the guarantees for a new situation? So, how guaranteed, for example, J star is good enough for you to buy that solution X star. But what's the guarantee that tomorrow you're going to incur a cost which is no worse than J star? So, and this is again as the inductive method of projecting the past into the future, creating knowledge from experience. And uh, this is the problem that I call from the visible to the invisible, from what I have seen to what I have not seen yet. And you start setting the stage. And here there is a major departure from my early days in a sense that I'm going to explain. So you group together all possible instances of uncertainty. So I'm not claiming that I know the shape and the properties of that set. I just group together all deltas in a big set, capital delta, and I would like to adopt a probability approach. So the different deltas come to me according to a probability. There are two facts to be remarked here. One is that this is a, a theory based on zero knowledge about the probability up there. So you know, moving from my early experience, I bumped into many problems like uh, you know, medical applications where trying to describe the real world is too much. Trying to describe the real world is too much. So I told myself, stay away from trying to describe the real world. And uh, a good uh, way to approach the problem is to study the problem on the picture on the right, which is the domain for decision. Don't try to describe the picture on the left. This can be whatever. And uh, in many applications, uh, this is way too much for you to address. Stay away from describing the real world. Stay at, up at that level. The other fact is that in this theory, the various deltas are supposed to be independent of each other, which is more much relevant to many applications, uh, machine learning, for example, finance with the medical applications, and so on and so forth. So tomorrow, you are going to experience a new delta. And it may happen that, uh, corresponding to X star, the value is below J star, which is good. You are minimizing. Or it is above, which is bad. Now, in principle, without knowing anything about the set, uh, but in principle, that's a thought experiment. You can group together all the bad cases. And the probability of that, you call the risk. The risk is stochastic, because it depends on the observations. And then there is a 
a uh, result here. This was proven back in year 2008 by the joint work uh, with uh, Simone Garatti, who is there, which uh, not by accident is another Sergio student. And uh, uh, so we proved that the risk uh, has a, a beta distribution, which means that. That's a beta distribution, that's another. And this is a totally distribution free result, which means that the risk uh, has a distribution which is known with zero knowledge about the initial distribution by which the deltas had been generated. So this allows us to keep the risk under control in many application endeavors, including finance, machine learning, uh, medical uh, application, and so on and so forth, uh, without describing the real world. So that's very important. And I would like to say that uh, this uh, is uh, really setting the major departure that I've taken from early days. That is, in the early days, there was this uh, theta parameter looming large there. And the idea was to describe it. Part could be described, part not. But the uh, emphasis was on the real, the real world. And uh, along my way, I will say that I took a departure from that, telling me the problems that we are addressing very often are way simpler than the real world itself. So stay away and concentrate on the goal. And this is how this beautiful theory was developed. However, there is a, a very fundamental fact here, which is that everything is uh, based on this uh, independence assumption. Deltas are independent. That's why. I believe this theory is not mature enough yet uh, to be fully applied to dynamical systems. So, and uh, Simone sitting there knows that it's very high in my priority list uh, for, uh, for the next 30 years. Uh, so uh, just, uh, just closing this, uh, I would like to say that uh, I do not know how successful I will be in the future to address this new challenge. But one thing I know for sure, that uh, this interest for this type of problems would have not uh, grown in me if it was not for uh, Sergio's initial uh, teachings uh, and the oldest would have not existed uh, without Sergio. So I really would like to close this just with one single word. Uh, uh, thank you, Sergio.